All right. Well, it tells me that I'm live. Well, that remains to be seen. Um, if you have your Bibles, we need to uh, open to the book of Acts. We are in Acts chapter 7, the longest chapter in the book of Acts, and we are going to try to knock it out today. So, um, let's get to it. No time for hanging around and uh, run, chasing bunny trails. So, we're looking at, as you know, we're looking at Stephen. Stephen was the most prominent of the uh, early deacons in the first church, albeit probably the, uh, he had the shortest tenure. Uh, we have considered the first part of his twofold testimony. He had a twofold testimony for Jesus Christ. Uh, that testimony consisted of what he did, and we saw that last week and at the end of chapter 6. We saw that his ministry as a deacon went well beyond the daily ministration of funds for the, for the widows of the church in Jerusalem. Uh, he did that, of course, but he did so much more than that as well. <clears throat> he went out into the community. Uh, he was sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was performing signs and wonders among the people. He was defending his faith in the face of staunch opposition. And his was a life that was sold out to the cause of Jesus Christ, and he was none the poorer for it. We might look at Stephen's life and consider it to be a tragedy, but it wasn't. It was exactly what it was meant to be. He fulfilled his purpose in the kingdom of God. And now in chapter 7, we've come to the the second part of his ministry. And that consists of what he said. And we find that Stephen was a man who had a lot to say. Uh, chapter 7 contains the longest address that's recorded in the book of Acts. And it is also one of the most important speeches, sermons, messages. Stephen is standing before the religious and the political leaders of the nation of Israel, men who represented the entire nation. And he is about to expose the tenuous nature of their standing before God. Now, he, these are men who were supposedly godly men. And uh, Stephen's about to show them that that is not the case. They're standing before God, the God they claim to love, the God they claim to serve, is not what they believed that it was. And how often is that true in people's lives today? Oh, we're just, me and God, we're just like that. Really? Let's see what the Bible says. What does the Bible say? And Stephen is going to, to give these, this, this group of individuals, he's going to give them yet another opportunity to recognize their sin, to repent of that sin, and to turn to Jesus Christ for salvation. If only, if only they will see the truth and then respond to it appropriately. See, that's all it takes. You've got to be able to see the truth and then respond to it appropriately. I think at the end of his sermon, they actually see the truth. They just don't respond to it appropriately. <laughs> they go the opposite direction. Uh, when the truth is revealed to us, if we're going to respond to it appropriately, we, do, we have to do so with honesty and humility. And that's the only true options that we have. Now, Stephen's address contains quite a bit of information. But it's also important for us to consider what's not in his address. First thing, uh, Stephen's address is not a defense on his behalf. Uh, Stephen does not deal directly with the, uh, all of the scurrilous uh, accusations that were made against him. Uh, this, this body of, of religious leaders, they have accused him of speaking blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Uh, they have accused him of uh, speaking derogatorily towards the temple, towards the law of Moses. And in an indirect way, Stephen is going to answer a couple of these accusations. Um, and he's going to do so as he goes along, but it is, it is clear from any perceptive observer that the speech that Stephen is about to give was not constructed, nor was it delivered 
for the purpose of securing an acquittal on his behalf. Stephen is not trying to get off the hook. Stephen is not trying to get away scot-free. Stephen has a purpose in his life, and that is to reveal the truth to the people standing before him, and that's what he's going to do no matter what happens to him. Stephen is not trying to remove himself from this dangerous situation. He, he views this as a divine opportunity to present true, pure Christianity as God's appointed and only acceptable way to worship. As you can imagine, that comes as quite a shock to people who are not Christians. But it is the truth. Secondly, uh, this speech is not a sermon like Peter's speech was at the day of Pentecost. Uh, on Pentecost, on that day, Peter quoted a passage from the Old Testament and then he would explain it. Stephen doesn't do this. But uh, that doesn't mean that his speech is not biblical. His speech is completely biblical because he is simply retelling Old Testament uh, stories. Old Testament events. Also, Peter preached about Jesus throughout his sermon. He preached about the resurrection. Stephen only mentions Jesus at the very end of his speech, and he doesn't even mention him by a name. He calls him the righteous one. And he never mentions the resurrection at all. So what in the world is Stephen doing here? Well, let's be clear. Stephen is not presuming to instruct the Sanhedrin on points of Jewish history that they were ignorant of. He knows that they knew Old Testament history, Jewish history, backwards and forwards, just as he did. No, all Stephen is doing here is he is merely emphasizing things in Jewish history that they may never have considered before. Slight truths that they were happy to ignore. You see, it's one of the most incredible flaws of human nature that after centuries of possessing the clear word of God, it was still possible for individuals to only see in the scriptures what they wanted to see. After hundreds of years of study, after hundreds of years of commentary and research, these men had settled on an interpretation of the word of God that suited their fleshly world view. And it suited their fleshly worldview quite comfortably. And Stephen is about to mess that up with some clear, simple reasoning from God's Word. From their own scriptures. Stephen didn't bring his own Bible. He was using their Bible to show them where they were wrong. But if you remember, if you recall from the Lord's ministry, that's what he did. He did it quite effectively, almost to the point of being humorous. All Jesus did to expose the fallacy of the long-held doctrines of the Sadducees was just point them back to the Word of God. The Sadducees, part of the, the reason they were different from the Pharisees is they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe there would be a resurrection. They didn't believe in the spiritual world. They didn't believe there were angels. And so you remember the story. The Sadducees came to him and they said, hey, they gave, him, they gave Jesus, they presented him some ridiculous hypothetical situation. This woman married a man and the man died, so she married his brother and then he died and she married his brother. There were seven of them. My goodness, eventually you get tired of going to the same wedding over and over again. But it was a, a hypothetical situation and they're trying to prove their point. If you have to use a ridiculous hypothetical uh, situation to prove your point. Your point's probably ridiculous itself. Uh, um, and so they, they presented this, and what did Jesus say? Jesus just gave them simple observation from the Old Testament. Don't you remember? I love what he says, you do err, not knowing the scriptures. Uh, you're wrong because you don't know your own Bible is basically what he was saying. Look back at the, at the, uh, uh, the, the story of the... the the burning bush. Jesus said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jesus, Don't you get it? He's the God of the living, not the dead. Abraham was gone. Isaac was gone. Jacob was gone. But God was still their God because they were still alive. Did the Sadducees see the logic in Jesus' answer? No, they hated him even more for pointing out the fact that they were wrong. And Stephen is about to receive the same response from this 
august body of religious leaders, these bastions of spiritual knowledge in Israel. Well, let's jump in and see what's going on. We've got a lot of reading to do, so I'll hurry. Verse 1, then the high priest said, are these things so? And he, speaking of Stephen, said, brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran, and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come up to a land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran, and from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which we, uh, you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on, but even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way, that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, says God. And after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob and Jacob begot the 12 patriarchs. Now, the high priest grants Stephen an opportunity to defend himself against these serious accusations. But little does he know that Stephen is about to reveal to the entire court from their own scriptures that the Jewish nation itself was guilty of worse sins than those they had accused him of committing. And the first sin on their list is their gross misunderstanding of their own spiritual roots. Stephen begins with Abraham, and he could have said a lot more about Abraham's life, but Stephen is very selective about the things that he emphasizes. And, he, he, and he's very selective because He's trying to allude to a specific point. He's trying to make a point to these learned men. And so there are three things to consider from Stephen's uh, delivery of his understanding of Abraham's life. The first thing Stephen emphasizes was that God appeared to Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia. Everybody knows where Mesopotamia is. Right? Even if you don't know where it's at, that's where Abraham was. Mesopotamia was not the land of Canaan. It was not Israel. It was not the promised land. And yet, God still appeared to Abraham there. Why does this matter? It matters because the point that Stephen is trying to make is God is not a God that is limited to one geographical place. He is the God of the whole world. Secondly, uh, Stephen tells them that God appeared to Abraham himself. It wasn't as if God stood on Mount Sinai and hollered out to Abraham in Haran, hey, come over here. No, God went to Abraham himself. He appeared to Abraham himself. And, and uh, Stephen goes in even further in verse 2, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. You see, the Jews equated the glory of God to places like the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, or in the temple. But Stephen reminds them, hey, guess what, guys? Before there was a tabernacle, before there was a temple, the glory of God was seen by Abraham, and he wasn't in Jerusalem. And finally, Stephen emphasized that Abraham was a pilgrim even when he was in the land of Canaan. Even though God had given him the land, as far as Abraham was concerned, he was only passing through it. Why? He was looking ahead. He was looking for something better. Hebrews tells us that he was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. Not him. Not someone else. God. That's what Abraham's vision was always forward. He didn't get hung up by looking at the things that he had, where he was at. He was always looking ahead to what God was doing. Abraham was the founder of the Hebrew people. And his relationship with God was based on grace and faith. The Bible tells us that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him 
for righteousness. Abraham was saved by grace through faith, not because he was circumcised, not because he obeyed the law, not because he worshipped in a tabernacle or a temple. All of those things came later. But Abraham believed the promises of God, and it was this faith in God's word that saved him. And this truth was lost on the Jews of Stephen's day. They prided themselves in being Abraham's children, but they were confusing a, a physical descent with an actual spiritual experience. And they were relying on their national heritage rather than personal faith in God. They had it all backwards. They were blind to the simple faith of Abraham. And they cluttered it all up with man-made traditions that made salvation a matter of good works, not faith. But here's the thing, when it comes to salvation, we don't get to pick how we're saved, right? God does that. If we want salvation, we've got to line up with what God says. What we say doesn't matter. What we want doesn't matter. There's another thing. These leaders, these religious giants, they were settled in their positions, so to speak. They were too much at home in the land of Israel. To them, they had achieved the pinnacle of power. They were making quite a good living off of their positions. They had forgotten that they were only supposed to be pilgrims. And without this eternal view, they lacked the same spiritual depth that Abraham had. They had stopped looking forward to what God had in store for them because they were too content at looking back. This is what God did for us back in the day. Yeah, we're all right. God gave us the, uh, the oracles. God gave us the law. God gave us the prophets. It's all us. It's all in what God gave us. You know, it's like Christians that you meet that say, oh, you know, I used to do this and oh, I used to do that. Man, that doesn't really matter. What are you doing now? You know, that's really what, what God's interested in. What are you doing now? But these men were taking the things of this world and the blessings that God had given them and the blessings that they received from the world. And they, they were considering these things to be permanent, but they're not. And that's something that we have to consider. The things that we have today, yes, they are blessings from God, but don't get used to them because they're not permanent. They will eventually fade away, sometimes sooner than later. I think a lot of people are going through some things right now that, uh, you know what? I thought I had a good job. There it goes. You know, I thought I had a good home. Well, there it goes. Things can change. And if we're holding on to them too tight, well, it comes as a shock. But if we're trusting in the Lord, if our worldview is on eternity, eh, easy, uh, here today, gone tomorrow. But these men had allowed God's temporal blessings to overshadow the sense of God's presence in their life. The most important thing that they needed was the presence of God, and that was the last thing they were thinking about. Let's move on. Verse 9. And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him and delivered him out of all of his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all of his house. Now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh, then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers, and they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for the sum of money, from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. So there's a lot of uh, uh, Old Testament history going on here. But we want to focus on the emphasis of Stephen. Why did he bring this up? Well, there, there happens to be another sin that Israel was guilty of. And that was simply this, that Israel had the bad habit of rejecting their God-sent deliverers. This isn't the, the last time this would happen. Joseph, as you recall, Joseph's story is one of my favorite from the Old Testament. Uh, Joseph was hated by his brothers. He was mistreated by his brothers. 
They sold him into slavery because they just couldn't stand being around him. Now, when I was growing up, I didn't realize that was an option. You know, I had a few brothers, and yeah, that would have been handy, you know. Some traveling band of gypsies come along. How much would you give me for this one? You won't get much work out of him, but uh, you'll get a lot of mouth out of him. I'm get, I guess it's glad it didn't happen because I've probably been the first one to be sold. <clears throat> But here's the thing, even though Joseph was in an Egypt, God was still with him. He emphasized that, that God was with him in Egypt, that terrible, terrible place. God was with him and he delivered him. God was not just with him, he was constantly with him. And his brothers, the patriarchs, they rejected Joseph. That's how he got to Egypt. But later, Joseph became a savior to them. In fact, he was the only possible savior for them. Start to get the correlation here of what's going on. And this isn't the only time this will happen. And Stephen's point is that all throughout their history, Israel persecuted and killed the prophets that God had sent to them, just as Joseph's brothers had persecuted him. And that's exactly what these men that Stephen is speaking to had done to Jesus Christ. He came to deliver him, and they rejected him. They didn't just reject him. They didn't sell him into slavery. They killed him. They had him killed. Let's move on to verse 17. This is going to be a long stretch because we're going to talk about Moses. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham... The people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. At this time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up in her, as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of Egypt, of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and deeds. Now, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian, for he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver him by his hands. But they did not understand. Little did he know. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting, and he tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Whoa, didn't realize that it got out. Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. And when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. <clears throat> this Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, Your Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. And this is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey but rejected, and in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us, as for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt. We do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, 
and rejoiced in the work of their own hands. <clears throat> and then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Molah and the star of your God, Rephman, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Wow. <clears throat> There's a lot of there. And we could spend the rest of our, the, probably the rest of the month unpacking all of that. But uh, we want to <clears throat> want to stick to looking at what Stephen was emphasizing. <clears throat> Stephen now shifts his focus to the topic of Moses because uh, that's who they accused him of, of uh, speaking against. <clears throat> and Stephen's going to make some similar points that he did with the other stories. But he's going to uh, deal with the story of Moses at greater length. Because that's the topic that the Sanhedrin was most concerned about. Moses was the one that God had given the law through. And, and these individual leaders, these people that were uh, holding Stephen accountable, they had built their whole lives around keeping the law of Moses. And while Stephen's opponents had accused him of speaking against the law of Moses... Stephen is showing them that it was the history of Israel uh, <clears throat> as a whole. They repeatedly broke the law of Moses. And Stephen makes three convicting points, if not convincing. Uh, first off, Stephen again says that Moses was rejected by the Jewish people. As you know, Moses grew up in Pharaoh's house, but... Uh, when he realized that his heart was for his people while well, he wanted to be with them, he realized that God was going to use him to deliver his people out of bondage. Uh, he wanted to be identified with them. But no matter what he did, no matter how he tried to help them, he was rejected by them. They wanted, they wanted nothing to do with him. He thought that they would follow him, but they didn't follow him. They rejected him. And of course, when the news of his uh, extracurricular activities got out, uh, Pharaoh had to flee for his life because he'd actually killed an Egyptian. And so he ran to Midian, where he spent the next 40 years. Uh, but Stephen uses this also to emphasize another point. He says that God appeared to Moses in Midian. First, he emphasized that God appeared to Abraham in Mesopotamia which was Gentile territory. Now he reminds them again that God also appeared to Moses in Midian, which was a Gentile mountain. God even went so far as to call that place holy ground. Oh my goodness. What are you talking about? Hey, Stephen didn't write that. Stephen didn't come up with that concept. Stephen's reading from a script. It's called the Old Testament. What was so shocking uh, the point that he's making is that this holy place was not even in Jerusalem. It wasn't on the Temple Mount. It was on a mountain in Gentile territory. And yet God was there. And because God was there, the ground that Moses stood on was holy. It was the presence of God that made it holy, not geography. So we should be catching Stephen's drift by now. And I'm sure that the, the Sanhedrin was catching that drift as well. Stephen was showing them again and again that their concept of God, how that God is the God of the Jews only and, and not the Gentiles, Stephen is showing them that this is a corrupt concept. This is a corrupt thing. And it had corrupted them completely. They had taken it to the worst possible extreme. But here's the thing, if these men were actually faithful to their traditions, if they were guided by what the scriptures had told them, then they would know that God is the God of all people and that they had an enormous responsibility of being a witness to them for him. Stephen was teaching that God is everywhere and that in every nation he has those individuals who are seeking him. Not just in Israel, but everywhere. And thirdly, 
Stephen makes the point that not only was Moses rejected when he first came, but Moses was rejected even later. After the Exodus, after all the signs and wonders, after God had proven that he was with Moses, the people rejected him still. The rejection that, most, uh, that Moses experienced when he killed the Egyptian was followed by an even more substantial rejection. While he was on the mountain, get it? I mean, just understand how this plays out. While he was on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, the people were down in the valley breaking the Ten Commandments. They couldn't even wait for him to get down. God had brought them out of Egypt with great power uh, in a miraculous way. God had revealed himself to be the true God. And the first of the Ten Commandments said, you shall have no other gods before me. And that's exactly what the people were doing. When Moses had turned his back, at the very moment the law was being given, the people were making idols for themselves, just like the idols in Egypt. They were committing adultery, and no doubt they were breaking just about all the other laws as well. I mean, if you're going to do one, you might as well do them all. If you can't be good, at least be consistent, right? Or if you can't be good, at least be good at it. <clears throat> That's what they were doing. But here's the thing. In rejecting God's law, they were also rejecting God. And they were also rejecting God's mouthpiece, which was Moses. And now here in verse 42, Stephen brings in the first of his direct quotations from the Old Testament. This one is from Amos 5, verses 25 through 27. Now, we need to understand that when Amos originally wrote this prophecy, he was writing it to, as a warning to the people in the northern kingdom of Israel. And they were going to be carried away by the Assyrians into, uh, beyond Damascus. But as you notice at the end of verse 43, Stephen changes it to say, instead of saying beyond Damascus, he says beyond Babylon. Why does he do that? Because Stephen's not speaking to descendants of the northern kingdom. He's speaking to the descendants of the southern kingdom of Judah. And the southern kingdom of Judah, if you know your Old Testament history, was carried off into captivity to Babylon. So he adjusts it to make a point, to drive it home. He wants to stick his bony finger in their chest so that they'll understand that, yes, I'm talking about you. Many times uh, preachers will broach a subject, a subject that is necessary, a subject that is, is important for individuals to hear, and you'll look out there and they'll be, they'll be agreeing with you. Dude, I'm talking about you. Why are you agreeing? You should be crying. <laughs> Obviously, it's just going right over their heads. Stephen wanted to make sure that this didn't go over their head. These, uh, <clears throat> these verses describe the judgment of God when he takes his hands off of sinners and permits them to have their own way. We see that in verse 42. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. What a terrible, terrible idea. To be given up by God. To be given up by God to do whatever you want. I think, well, isn't that something good? <laughs> Not necessarily. <clears throat> In quoting Amos, Stephen was revealing what the Jewish nation had actually been doing all of these years. Outwardly, they were worshiping Jehovah, but in their hearts, they were still worshiping foreign gods. Or let me say it like this. They were worshiping gods of their own making. The law was given to the Jews to protect them from all the pagan influence that surrounded them and to enable them to enjoy the blessings of the land that God had given to them. It was the law of Moses that made them a holy people, different than all the other nations. But when Israel broke down that wall of distinction by breaking God's law... They rightfully forfeited all of the blessings of God. And they also rightly had to be disciplined by God. And so the point Stephen is making is that this, this attitude of Joseph's brother and the attitude of the people who came out of Egypt has been the characteristic of the Jewish people throughout their history. The Sanhedrin was part of that history. They had fallen into that same trap as well. 
They were descendants of those who returned to Canaan from Babylon. And the same idolatrous spirit that took their ancestors into Babylon was still dwelling in their hearts. They had been breaking the law of Moses all their lives. And they were rejecting Moses. And because they were rejecting Moses, they naturally rejected the truth of Jesus as well. You see, if they truly loved Moses, they would do what Moses told them. Moses said, look, another, another prophet is coming. Look out for him. Because he's the one you really got to listen to. And when that other prophet showed up, what did they do? They ignored him. They killed him. Oh, we love Moses. Yeah, well, you don't do what he says, so how can you say you really love him? Let's move on. Verse 44. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However... The Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all of these things? The false witnesses had accused Stephen of trying to destroy the temple, speaking against the temple. But the truth of the matter is, that's exactly what the Jewish nation had done. Moses built the tabernacle, and God's glory graciously dwelt in the Holy of Holies. Later, Solomon built the temple, and again, God's glory came in. But over the years, the worship at the temple degenerated into mere religious formality. And eventually, the nation of Israel even put their idols in the temple. Now, in Stephen's day, there were no idols allowed in the temple, but that didn't matter. Because the Jews had turned the temple itself into their idol. They were no longer worshiping the God of the temple, they were worshiping the temple of God. And that was their problem, they got it backwards. The religious leaders, they loved the temple. But the problem is they could not see beyond it. That meant everything to them. You see, Solomon recognized that God didn't live in buildings made with hands. And man can't make anything for God because everything comes from God. And so the Jewish defense of their temple was both illogical as well as unscriptural. But the truth was is that in that day, the temple, the day of the temple, the the the, the usefulness of the temple was passing away. What does uh, the Bible say that happened when Jesus died? The, the minute he died on the cross, a lot of things happened. But one important thing happened was the veil of the temple that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place was torn in two. And that was a miracle in itself that should have said something to the priest, to the high priest, to the, those that ministered in the temple. That the way into the presence of God was now open. Did it? No, they got their sewing kit out and they just sewed that little veil right back up. Oh, we can fix that. I don't know how that happened, but we got, we got that taken care of. God, don't worry. No one's going to get into your glory. We'll make sure of that. And they did. They tried their darndest. The temple had been a blessing to Israel. It had served an important purpose. But the necessity of the temple was passing away because Jesus Christ had come. And Jesus was the real temple. And those who believed on him, those who accepted him, those who uh, trusted him for salvation, they became temples to, of the Holy Spirit as the living God comes to dwell within them. So if you think about it, instead of refuting the accusations that were made against him, Stephen is indirectly admitting that, well, yeah, they are kind of true. I mean, he was kind of saying that you don't really need the temple anymore. Uh, it's kind of defunct. It's, it's, a, it's a lame duck. Uh, that's a nice political uh, terminology. Uh, it serves no purpose. That veil has been rent. And no amount of sowing is going to change the truth that it 
reflects. What Stephen is trying to tell them is that God is not the God of the Jews only, but of the Gentiles as well. And it is to the Gentiles that the gospel is now going to go. And so this, this speech has prominence in Acts because it marks the closing of the exclusive Jewish mission of the church. And it indicates the opening of the gospel to Gentile communities. And we're going to see that in the very next chapter. God is going to, to use this speech to show that there is no longer any theological reason to prevent the gospel from going out to the Gentiles. The door is being swung open. And the whole idea behind having a permanent stationary temple is simply this. You come to me. And this is why Israel, though they were supposed to be the light of the world. This is why Israel mainly thought in terms of the world coming to them for salvation. Why? Because we have the temple. But you see, through the church, through the, through the tr Christian church, God is going to reveal a different heart. Instead of saying, you come to me, God is now saying, I will come to you. I will bring the gospel to you. Jesus said that to his disciples. You will be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You, I'm sending you, I'm sending you out. God is going to go to the sinner. Well, let's see how this flies. Verse 51. You know, when you, when you deliver a sermon, you always want to bring it home with a good application. And, uh, well... I don't know if Stephen brought it home, but he sure did go home with his application. Verse 51, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Wow, I bet that parted their hair. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by direction of angels and have not kept it. He could not put a finer point on that than he did right there. So instead of, you know, laying out his application in a nice, cheerful, accommodating way like a New Testament deacon ought to, no, Stephen drops a bomb on them just like the Old Testament prophets. He stuck his bony finger in their face and said, you are the problem. You are the sinners. You are the one who are breaking God's law. You are the one who are resisting God. You've done it your entire history and you're doing it now. Stephen makes three accusations against these religious leaders. Number one, they were resisting the Holy Spirit as they always had done. Number two, they were persecuting and killing the prophets as they always had done. And number three, they were breaking the law of Moses as they always have done. He was kind of, he didn't just show it to them, he was rubbing her face in. 20 times in the Old Testament, God calls Israel stiff necked. So when Stephen threw that out, they understood exactly what he was talking about. Because these religious leaders were acting exactly like their forefathers had acted. Every bad example in the Old Testament, they were living it over again. They were upholding it like it was their job in life. But the reality is their rejection of God, their rejection of the law of Moses, their resistance of the Holy Spirit made them no better than the Gentiles. You guys think you have it all? You're just like the Gentiles. As a matter of fact, you're worse than the Gentiles because you think you're right, and you're not. So let's see the conclusion of this. Verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And that's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing. But how do they respond to it? And they gnashed at him with their teeth. Now, that's never happened to me. <laughs> About four inches. <laughs> okay. I might have to have that, uh, what do you call that, concealed carrier or something. <laughs> they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. 
And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. That's significant because his, his speech began with the glory of God. It began with the God of glory, and it ends with the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. That should have been his first clue that things were going south fast. When you see Jesus, uh, you know you're going to see Jesus. But what did he say in verse 56? And he said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And then, get this, they cried out with a loud voice. They stopped their ears and they ran at him with one accord. How infantile. Hey, nobody here anymore. Of course, they proved they were men in verse 58. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Uh, Luke gives us the, the, the gentlest form of death that he can. In the midst of a very violent death, Luke just says, that Stephen fell asleep, and when he woke up, why? He was in the presence of God. He wasn't seeing that glory from afar. He was experiencing it himself. Stephen's message was true, and it was accurate, and it was convicting. But instead of responding with humility and repentance, this esteemed gathering of spiritual giants, they, they blew their collective tops and they attacked Stephen. Like, like children, they covered their ears, they rushed him outside, and they stoned him themselves. They didn't even get the Romans to come do it. They say, we'll take care of this one ourselves. And so it's difficult not to contrast the demeanor of Stephen as opposed to the demeanor of the people he was talking to. I mean, you can generally tell the way people act, who's right and who's wrong. <laughs> Stephen didn't care. Eh, take your best shot. I see you. Pick up the big rock. No, get the big one. The other guys were going crazy. They were running around like their hair was on fire. The source of Stephen's courage, the source of his wisdom, the source of his power in his preaching was the fact that he was full of the Holy Spirit. But what were the, the individuals of the Sanhedrin full of? The murderous nature of the Sanhedrin shows that they weren't being affected by the Holy Spirit of all. In fact, that phrase in verse 57 that says that they ran at him with one accord, that's a very telling, telling phrase, a, a very telling word. It's the same word that was used to describe the mad rush of the herd of swine into the sea in Mark chapter 5, verse 13. Now, why did that uh, herd of swine run, rush madly into the sea? Well, they were filled with, uh, with demons, with evil spirits. The same word is used of these men. So this accurately reveals the kind of spirit that was directing and empowering these men. Their reaction is typical of those who reject God and are lost in their own spiritual insanity. They were beside themselves. And so here at the very end, we see Stephen's final ministerial role. We noticed before that he was a deacon, that he was an evangelist. We see today in his speech that he is a judge. He is judging the nation of Israel. He is laying out their sins. He's not accusing them. He is revealing to them where they are wrong. And here at the end, his last job as a Christian is to be a martyr. A Christian martyr. The first Christian martyr. Uh, martyr is a word that comes from the Greek martyrs, uh, which simply means a witness, a one who bears a testimony. And so in the English, uh, the word martyr has come to be known as a person who dies for their beliefs. Doesn't matter what it is. If you stand on your beliefs and you're, you're killed for that, then you're, you're looked at as a martyr. But a Christian martyr is a person who is killed for their witness of Jesus Christ. And Stephen was the first Christian martyr, but he will certainly not be the last. Uh, but Stephen was an outstanding witness for Jesus Christ, and it led to his death 
But as we can see, Stephen valued the opportunity to speak the truth more than he valued his own life. He wasn't worried about that. He knew where he was going. He knew God would take care of him. One way or the other, God's going to take care of him. You know, say, oh, but it must be terrible being... Yeah, it only hurts for a little while. You know? I asked my mom years ago, eh, it must have been painful having so many kids. Eh, it only hurts for a little while. Eh, it didn't set right. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's true, but... <clears throat> I don't think that's true, but hey, she liked being a mom, I guess. But Stephen valued the opportunity to speak the truth to these individuals more than he valued his own life. Now, Stephen's death meant different things to different people. For him, it meant a coronation. Stephen would receive his victor's crown, and Jesus was standing there waiting to receive him so that he could bestow that upon him. But for the nation of Israel, Stephen's death meant condemnation. This was their third murder, if you're keeping score. The nation of Israel permitted John the Baptist to be killed. They asked for Jesus to be killed. And now, when faced with the truth from Stephen, they decided they'd kill him themselves. Third time's a charm. Spilling of innocent blood. Uh, there will be judgment. And judgment finally came in the year AD 70 when Titus and the Roman armies entered in Jerusalem, destroyed the wall, destroyed the city, destroyed the temple. Everything that they held sacred was trampled on and dispatched relatively easily. All they left was the foundation of the temple. That's what the, holy, uh, the wailing wall is now. That's not a wall. That is the foundation of the temple. Um, the reason that they, they did so well at destroying the temple is the, before they destroyed it, the temple was actually, the, the dome of the temple was covered in gold. The Romans went in, they set fire to the temple, gutted it from the inside. Guess what happened to all that gold? Well, it melted and it ran into the cracks and the crevices of the wall. How are you going to get to it? You tear down the wall. Shove you a big old uh, crowbar in there and start pushing things over. So their own glory became their demise. The things that they were trusting in is actually the things that caused them to be destroyed. Condemnation. Now, for the church, the death of Stephen meant liberation. They were now free to witness to the Gentiles. They had been witnessing to the Jews since the day of Pentecost. But now they were able to fan out across the empire and carry the gospel to the Gentiles. But for one individual, the death of Stephen meant salvation. As we see here at the end of the chapter, there's a young man named Saul. And it seems that Stephen's message, his prayer, and his glorious death were eventually used by the Holy Spirit to prepare Saul's heart for his own meeting with Jesus Christ. You see, God never wastes the blood of the saints. The blood of the saints are the seeds of the church. One day, Saul is going to see the same glory that Stephen saw. And one day, Saul is going to meet the very Son of God, and he is going to hear him speak. And on that day, Saul is going to respond appropriately with honesty and humility, and he is going to be saved. Let's, let's stand. Didn't think I had it in me. 60 verses. <clears throat> Verse 42 says, Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. As I said, this is the worst form of punishment that God can mete out to anyone, allowing sinners to remain in their sin without deterrence, without distraction, without conviction. Oh my goodness. Now you might think, well, that's exactly what sinners want, and you would be true. But to what end? To what end? It leads to total destruction, because that's what sin does. That's all that sin does. Sin unabated will wreak havoc in a life, and it will bring other destruction on those who are unfortunate enough to be consigned 
to that painful judgment. You know, the people today, we just want God to leave us alone. No, 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 you don't. You really don't. The Apostle Paul built on this idea of God giving man over to his sinful desires in Romans chapter 1, and it's not a pretty picture. Not at all. But I don't need to tell you that because you can see it for yourselves on the daily news. We see it taking place all over. We are witnessing the ever-increasing collapse of our society. And it is in direct consequence of sin that is undeterred and sin that is unconvicted. So here's the question that each person needs to consider. If we reject Jesus, what will we be given up to? I believe that everyone here has accepted Christ as their Savior. And uh, that's a good thing. We need to be willing to accept His presence in our life, to accept His will for our lives, and to pursue that as well. Uh, the judgment that I'm speaking about here, I don't believe that applies to God's people. Because God will not leave us alone. If you are His child, He will not leave you alone, whether you want Him to or not. But the, uh, the reality is, is what kind of fellowship do we enjoy with him? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for this time. We thank you for this day. Lord, this opportunity that you have given us to, to study your word, to, to maybe take the truth of your word and, and allow it to be a mirror in our own lives. Lord, it's easy for us to sit down and look at other people and say, Oh, I see where you appear in this chapter. I see your position. I see your spot. What about our spot? Where do we show up in this chapter? Lord, are we, Stephen, standing for the truth of God, or are we more like the Sanhedrin, living in our own made-up world of religion, worshiping idols that we have fashioned for ourselves? Lord, just because we believe we're true doesn't mean we're true. It doesn't mean we're right. It's only... When we align with what your word says, it's only when we follow the truths and the principles that are laid out in Scripture can we even begin to assume that we're accurate. Lord, I pray that as your people, that our hearts would be in tune not only with your word, but your will for our lives. Help us to be open to your spirit, his guidance, his direction, his conviction, Lord, and help us to respond to that conviction with humility and with honesty, Lord, submitting ourselves to your word and to your will every time. Lord, be with us as we leave this place. Be with those, Lord, that we have uh, lifted up in prayer and mentioned their names. Lord, again, we ask for Miss Kelly that you would give her strength and guide the doctor's hand tomorrow as they perform the surgery and uh, strengthen uh, her family, Lord, that they might uh, be there to assist her. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And we pray that you bring us back again safely next week. Watch over us this week. Give us opportunities, Lord, to share your gospel. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 I didn't stop. Is there a finish button?